good to go nikita yes sir yeah so shall we start now it's 6 o'clock exactly yes sir okay well good evening everybody i am dr mangesh tiwaskar and i welcome you all to this uh, webinar which has been done uh, in partnership uh, with academy of medical education endocrine society of india geriatric society of india and association of physicians of india along with the academic partnership of toran pharmaceuticals now it gives me a immense pleasure to be a moderator not only moderator but also to be one of the listeners because these three guys that i have on the panel today are the experts in their field and they have genuinely have a phenomenal information and educate education material for all of us to really know in this time of epidemic so without wasting much of the time i would request first dr om j lakhani who is from ahmedabad so om is a very personal friend of mine primarily we keep on meeting in multiple diabetes and endocrine meets om practices at zaidas hospital he is a qualified endocrinologist from sanga sir gangaram hospital and now currently is the president's gold medal winner in endocrinology he is a national winner of esi taisa you know uh, which is again a torrent young scholar program and also he is winner of multiple gold medals i would request om to start his presentation and also i request all the three speakers to try and stick to their timings of around 15 12 to 15 minutes so that we'll have maximum time to you know take a lot of questions from the uh, audience so that it will be easier for us to have a further interaction so with these few words i would request dr om to start his presentation please dr om uh thank you very much sir uh thank you for the kind words of introduction and i'm going to talk about endocrine vigilance in uh covid-19 infection so what we're going to talk about is uh the pituitary gland thyroid gland and the adrenal gland now we would not be discussing uh diabetes because it was already covered in one of the earlier presentations so we would be going pure endocrine this time now let's talk about the pituitary gland and the covid-19 infection now the point i'd like to make highlight first is that unfortunately we do not have too much data on covid-19 the sars-cov-2 uh infection so most of the things what i'm going to talk about is from a prior uh, uh epidemic which was sars-cov-1 and uh, you know uh, often viruses tend to infect endocrine systems in a similar way so i i do hope that what i'm going to talk about is will also be relevant to the current pandemic now let's talk about a very interesting phenomena which was seen after the earlier sars uh, infection which was post sars sickness syndrome now this is a very nice commentary published in endocrine clinical endocrinology uh, a very uh, a highly rated journal and it's about post uh, post sars sickness syndrome now before i begin i'd like to just reiterate the newton's law of motion right an object tends to remain at rest or continues to move at a constant velocity unless it is acted upon by a force so what happens is in case of severe physiological stress or infection there is often an inflammation which activates the uh, hpa axis that is hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis which leads to infection or inflammation and that further eventually resolves now once the infection and inflammation resolves the hp axis is immediately down regulated so for a while let's say for a couple of weeks or for months you might be at a higher physiological stress higher cortisol production and suddenly a break has been hit but your body is still not adapted to that and that is what often leads to sickness syndrome now the sickness syndrome can be seen with similar phenomena in other cases for example in case of sudden withdrawal of glucocorticoids uh those who have been treating endocrine conditions would have seen that in treatment of cushing syndrome post cushing syndrome now you think you have done a great job but the patient really does not feel too good chronic fatigue syndrome has also been thought to be a form of sickness syndrome fibromyalgias and post viral arthralgias or arthritis have similar features uh the symptoms often being fatigue depressed mood myalgia arthralgia anorexia weight loss and uh, you know a lot of physicians treating viral infections would know that the patient becomes better yet after a few weeks comes with these symptoms which are very vague and often very difficult to point out to 
Now, this is the uh, entire uh, you know, HPA axis. We all know that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is activated in case of any kind of physiological stress and uh, you know, the infection or inflammation. So it's like a two-way system. On one hand, the infection and inflammation uh, you know, tries to uh, you know, increase the WBC count, in increase the other uh, systems, and the cortisol tries to keep things in check. So this is what often uh, happens. Now, this is a very interesting article from Dr. Leo. Uh, in this, uh, this is from Singapore. And uh, uh, what they've done is they studied these patients with, uh, you know, who were survivors of SARS. Uh, and what they found was that these patients who actually presented with the sickness syndrome actually had documented hypocortisolemia, that is reduced cortisol level, right? There was actual reduction in cortisol level. This is a very interesting study. And I hope a similar study has been, is, is in done in future in the new uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, interestingly, 40% of the patients with SARS-CoV-1 survivors had evidence of hypocortisolemia, that is central adrenal insufficiency in their cohort, which is a massive number. Think of thousands of patients who are going to come up, who are going to survive the current pandemic and they are going to come up with similar symptoms. Other post-viral phenomena like chronic fatigue syndrome also have, no, have been known to produce hypocortisolemia. In fact, one of the uh, you know, pathophysiology of chronic fatigue syndrome is probably low cortisol. Another important phenomena, which was seen in case of the earlier SARS infection was a phenomena known as lymphocytic hypophysitis. Now we are all aware about thyroiditis, that is an inflammation of the thyroid gland. In a similar ma manner, if there's an inflammation of the pituitary gland, that is known as lymphocytic hypophysitis. Now, lymphocytic hypophysitis, just like the thyroid gland, can be because of autoimmune phenomena, but can also be secondary to infections or inflammations. Lymphocytic hypophysitis has re been reported secondary to SARS-CoV-1. So in earlier reports, and this is the reference below, uh, you know, there were cases of lymphocytic hypophysitis actually documented in the earlier SARS. Now, before I go ahead, how do you actually diagnose central adrenal insufficiency? What is very interesting is that unlike the more popular form of adrenal insufficiency, that is primary adrenal insufficiency, which is also known as Edison syndrome, uh, which is because of the adrenal involvement, the involvement of pituitary is more subtle and sometimes often clinically missed. And these patients, unlike primary adrenal insufficiency, do not present with hyperkalemia, do not present with darkening of the skin because the ACTH level is not high, rather it is low because the problem actually lies in either thalamus, hypothalamus or the pituitary. So what you do is primarily you measure the baseline cortisol value. A cortisol value less than five, perhaps less than three would strongly suggest a central adrenal or an adrenal insufficiency for that matter. A value often more than 12 or 13 would more or less rule out adrenal insufficiency. Now, when you have a value between you know, 6 to 12 or 6 to 13, uh, the test you should do, and you know, this is why I'm trying to put this because you know, uh, generally endocrinologists advise ACTH stimulation test, but there are a lot of data. And this, this is a very interesting study, interesting review actually published in endocrine practice where they actually found that the measurement of DHES, which is also a hormone produced by the adrenal gland, if the DHES is low, it tends to suggest a higher probability of having adrenal insufficiency versus if the DHES value is often normal, it tends to often rule out adrenal insufficiency. So DHES is a simple blood test. It doesn't require fasting. It is a long half-life and it's often just like you know, uh, HbA1c or a glycated albumin tells you about a longer picture of the glycemic control. In the same way, your DHES often tells you about a longer period of adrenal involvement rather than at that momentary span of time. So uh, as a request, I would suggest try using cortisol along with DHES for assessment of the HPA access, especially in patients who come with post-COVID. Now, those who are interested, uh, you can please note down this link. This is decisionsmed.com slash DEA1. Uh, we have this uh, decision-making tool which will help you decide whether your patient uh, suffers from adrenal insufficiency or not. Of course, this is not uh, just uh, restricted to COVID-19. This can be seen, uh, you know, this tool can be used for, in general also, for other adrenal insufficiency cases as well. Right, now, 
So the first important take home message I'd like to point out is that lymphocytic hypophysitis and post SARS syndrome have been reported with the SARS earlier SARS pandemic and both can often lead to central adrenal insufficiency. And this is a very important uh, disease which has to be ruled out in these patients. Now coming to the thyroid gland and a very important phenomena, one of my favorite diseases is subacute thyroiditis. Now subacute thyroiditis is very well known to be a sequelae of viral infection, right? And often has been called also known as a viral thyroiditis. So it's a very, very common disease. It is more common than we think. And ask your ENT colleagues, often they will come and tell you that subacute thyroiditis is not an uncommon disorder. Now, how do these patients, you know, uh, uh, oh, okay. So this was earlier not reported with SARS-CoV-1. However, viral infections and pandemics, including H1N1, have often led to a sequelae of a large number of cases of subacute thyroiditis. And I do expect uh, more cases to come around. However, at this point of time, we have some reports from across the country, often shared in our, in our groups, WhatsApp groups and emails. Uh, we have seen thyroid function tests uh, suggestive of subacute thyroiditis in COVID hotspots around the country. This is not a published thing. Uh, we are trying to collect more data on this, but let's see where we end up with. Uh, we have written a review for GEMA uh, on subacute thyroiditis. If anybody's interested, you can check out this review. I think it's a, uh, you know, uh, it's a very comprehensive review on this subject. Now, what happens with subacute thyroiditis is initially you have a thyrotoxic phase, which may often last for three to four weeks. Then you tend to have a hypothyroid phase, again, lasting for a few weeks. And ultimately the patient often becomes euthyroid. The symptoms uh, during the thyrotoxic phase are similar to any thyrotoxicosis. Patient presents with weight loss, fevers, tremors, pain and tenderness in the thyroid gland, often radiating to, radiating to the ear. If you have this type of patient after your coronavirus infection, uh, you should be thinking of subacute thyroiditis. Simple thyroid function test can diagnose this very easily. Uh, typically, the lab investigations in thyrotoxicosis, as we are all aware, will show elevated T3, elevated T4 with a reduced ESH. But remember, all thyrotoxicosis are not Graves' disease, right? This is a very important thing. Anybody who presents with thyrotoxicosis doesn't automatically have Graves' disease. In fact, subacute thyroiditis is an important differential diagnosis of this condition. This is something you should all be aware about. So don't start carbimazole and methimazole in all patients with thyrotoxicosis. It is very important to first determine the etiology and then consider treating it. How do you diagnose subacute thyroiditis? If you have the facility of a thyroid scan, a Technetium 99 thyroid scan shows reduced uptake of the tracer. A TSH receptor antibody is a simple blood test which can be done, slightly expensive, not available everywhere, but it can be done very easily. Uh, in big labs, generally you have this test available and it is often negative in case of subacute thyroiditis and it is positive in case of Graves' disease. The ESR and CRP are often elevated, especially during the thyrotoxic phase. Uh, patients with subacute thyroiditis have a predominant T4 elevation compared to T3 elevation. And often the thyroid function test improves during the course of time, which is a very, very important clinical finding, which you'll see. Now, how do you treat subacute thyroiditis? You use beta blocker, the thyrotoxic phase, uh, uh, during the thyrotoxic phase, if necessary, uh, you can consider using NSAIDs if the patient has fever. And if the patient does not respond to either of these things, you can consider doing, uh, 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 you know, using glucocorticoids for this condition, right? So, and, and you know, uh, uh, when I was a resident, my boss, uh, Dr. Surinder Kumar used to say that, you know, glucocorticoids act like a Ramban, right? It works perfectly like a lock and key in case of subacute thyroiditis. As, as soon as you give, uh, you know, glucocorticoids, the patient often improves, right? Uh, other thyroid issues which we expect uh, to happen after, after, uh, this is that, you know, uh, COVID or any viral infection can be a trigger for autoimmune phenomena. We can expect more cases of Hashimoto's and Graves disease after this because viral infection, like I said, could trigger an autoimmune phenomena. This is also seen with prior, uh, uh, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-1 and also other viral infection. A very interesting study, they actually did an autopsy study of patients who died because of the earlier coronavirus. And what they found was that the thyroid follicular architecture was altered 
it showed distortion and dilatation and collapse. What it basically means is that you do have thyroid involvement with the earlier coronavirus, and you can expect the same from the newer one. Uh, the most common, however, and very interestingly, the most common thyroid function abnormality reported with the SARS-CoV-1 was a central hypothyroidism type of picture where the T3 was reduced, T4 was reduced, but the TSH was either mildly elevated, reduced, or normal. And this type of pattern is often suggestive of central hypothyroidism. So if you have a TSH, which is elevated, but the value is not more than 10, but the T3 and T4, especially the free T4 is reduced, this is more likely to suggest a central hypothyroidism rather than a primary hypothyroidism. Remember the TSH, if it's more than 10, again, it could still suggest a primary hypothyroidism. So this is something we should keep in mind. So this type of picture, like I said, would suggest central hypothyroidism. Now, central hypothyroidism was commonly reported with SARS-CoV-1. Like I said earlier, it is probably because of lymphocytic hypophysitis, which was noted in the earlier infection. Now, a patient, let's say if you have a patient with hypothyroidism as well as adrenal insufficiency, now it could be often secondary or primary, which would you treat first? So we actually wrote a paper on this. This was two, a patient having both primary hypothyroidism and primary adrenal insufficiency. The important thing is always correct the adrenal insufficiency first before correcting the hypothyroidism. I repeat, correct the adrenal insufficiency before treating the hypothyroidism. If you do the other way around, if you treat the thyroid first, the patient can go into an adrenergic crisis. So this is something you should keep in mind. Like I said, this is a paper from us where the patient actually landed with an adrenergic crisis and we often learn the hard way. Non-thyroidal illness, that is sick Q thyroid syndrome picture, may be commonly seen in sick patients with viral pneumonia. Uh, this may be often seen in your ICU patients or, or patients who just recovered from the ICU. This is a typical uh, uh, spectrum that you see in patients uh, with non-thyroidal illness. You often have the T3, which is low, uh, the T4 eventually dips and the TSH may show a normal value and eventually slightly increase and again come back to normal. So typically, you will find a low T3 with often normal to low T4 and a normal TSH. This type of picture often suggests a sick Q thyroid syndrome or a non-thyroidal illness. So an important take-home message is central hypothyroidism was commonly reported with SARS-CoV-1, possibly because of lymphocytic hypophysitis. And this is something you should be kept in mind. Now, talking about the adrenal gland, patients may have a pre-existing adrenal insufficiency. These patients need special care during coronavirus infection. Because they are on glucocorticoids, they might be at a slightly higher risk of contracting the infection. And remember, these patients need to follow the sick day rules. So if the patients are already on glucocorticoids for adrenal insufficiency, sick day rules need to be applied in case of infection. Uh, the current endocrine society guidelines says that it relates to COVID-19. Any patient presenting with dry continuous cough and fever should immediately double their daily dose of oral glucocorticoids and continue till the fever subsides. This is from the guideline. So if you have patients with adrenal insufficiency, please send this message to your patient saying that if they do develop fever, cough, before even before they test for COVID-19, they should consider increasing their dose of your glucocorticoid. Now, remember patients, uh, you know, though glucocorticoids are not being advised as a part of treatment protocol, uh, some patients may be given glucocorticoids and if given for a longer period of time, glucocorticoids itself may cause central adrenal insufficiency and the tapering has to be done very delicately. Uh, some of your patients, like your COPD or asthma patients may be on long-standing glucocorticoids, including inhale agents. And remember even Inhale agents can cause HPA axis suppression, and such patients may have HPA axis suppression. They may develop, uh, you know, uh, 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 adrenergic crisis if they develop infection. So these patients require special care and require special, uh, you know, uh, uh, to be watched out for. Uh, again, we have another review on this uh, management of primary adrenal insufficiency. We contrasted uh, what happens in developed and developing countries, and you know, we found that in our country, unfortunately we are not following all the rules and we should be doing it more in a better way. So important take home messages are all your patients with adrenal insufficiency, tell them about the sick day rules, doubling the dose of glucocorticoids if they do develop uh, infection, especially COVID-19 infection. 
So just to summarize some important take home messages, lymphocytic hypophysite is in post SARS syndrome, which is seen with SARS-CoV-1, uh, can lead to central adrenal insufficiency. It's an important disorder. Subacute thyroiditis is a possible sequelae uh, of the virus. All thyrotoxic causes are not Graves' disease and does not merit treatment with carbamazole or metamazole. Central hypothyroidism was commonly reported with SARS-CoV-1, possibly because of lymphocytic hypothyroidism. And coexistence of hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency, correct the adrenal insufficiency first. Remember the sick day rules for your patients with pre-existing adrenal insufficiency. Thank you. These are my email address and you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Om. Uh, that was wonderful. And I appreciate that you have stuck to your timing. So friends, uh, once again, I 